My name is Mike Tallhammer. I'm the chief of physics for uh, an institution called Centura within the United States, uh, based out of Denver, Colorado. Uh, we have just a quick run through of our facility. We have uh, nine institutions uh, currently delivering radiation oncology as far uh, for therapy reasons. Uh, we have 13 machines, all but two of them currently are true beams. Five of them are outfitted with SGRT. Uh, at those five facilities, we treat 100% of our patients completely tattooless. Um, and with uh, SGRT as the primary setup modality. So 100% of the patients are completely uh, tattooless at our facility, have been for about four or five years. Um, so we've got quite a lot of experience with tattooless, uh, but we use the SGRT system for a number of different things. We use it to, as a data acquisition tool to measure quality and what we can do as far as customization of what we deliver to our patients as far as what type of care we're delivering, how we address radiation oncology concerns within our facilities. And we also look at it from a standpoint of how do we monitor the quality of what we do on a daily basis. And so it is an observer-based pattern technology, uh, very familiar to other people in industry. And so we can use that tool to basically measure the quality of what we do on an end-to-end -end product. So when we're delivering uh, treatment to a patient who may be a DIBH patient, uh, we're getting all of that information in real time that's being dumped to a data file. We can then mine that data file and see how well are we adhering to what we say our quality metrics are. And so with that, these are my disclosures. I do provide physics consultation services, both Vision RT and Varian. Um, we are a reference site for both uh, vendors uh, and Vision RT's paid for me to come here. Uh, when we talk about head and neck and data-driven and mobilization, uh, what we really are basing that is on a foundation of postural setup and IGRT augmentation. So we've heard a lot of talks today uh, about how SGRT complements IGRT. It is not an outright replacement of IGRT. Uh, it is a different um, metric. So we're, we're basically using an optical-based technology so we can use that to complement and augment our IGRT process. It is not a tool that's gonna completely replace the IGRT process. And so with that, um, Real quick view of what is postural setup. This is the setup of a patient. In this case, this is my eight-year-old son. It's an optical technology, it's totally safe. Please don't turn me in, I didn't irradiate him. Um, <laughs> but he is an eight-year-old little boy, so you can see how well this little boy can sit still. Uh, in this case, you can see the gray ROI, the region that we're setting up through the treatment area. But outside of that ROI, we can also get postural information. So now we can look at, is the posture of the patient appropriate for what we're trying to deliver? In this case, he's in an arms up, uh, very typical position for a breast tangents uh, or supraclavicular field, or even uh, something like a lung SBRT, uh, where you're looking at maybe delivering a high apical lesion where you're gonna come over the shoulder or something like that uh, for an SBRT type delivery in the high apex of the lung. You can look at the statistics of what this is, and we've had uh, other workshops that have talked about service statistics, so I won't go uh, terribly in depth, but it is a good way of highlighting uh, the postural changes or the, uh, the uh, body morphology changes that you may experience with patients swelling uh, or decreasing in weight over the course of treatment, uh, which we just heard about in a couple of our talks. Um, you can look, use this to basically identify, in this case, we had him simulated referenced imaged with his uh, chin turned up and away like you would for a very high supraclavicular field. Uh, and in this case, when he came back to actually do this, he forgot what side he looked to. It's very easily identifiable from the heat map that he's looking in the wrong direction. So we can correct that posture, make sure his head's in the right position and service stats can easily tell us that 99% of the points are now in the right position. So now we can actually correct the posture in real time, making sure that these patients not only are correct throughout the treatment region, but also have the correct posture outside of the treatment region so we're not entering through their face or through an arm or something of those natures. And so with this, you can also, again, use this to correct the arm position. In this case, um, here we can see it in two different views. You can see the gray and green, which is very similar to what you would do for a treatment capture. Uh, on the right-hand side is more of a heat map view, blue being below the surface, red being above the surface, green being within the tolerance, uh, and you're typically moving from red to blue. Uh, my therapists prefer the green and gray. I prefer my brain works in apparently green, blue, and red. Um, so whichever version you would like to use, I, I recommend um, trying them both out and kind of getting what works best uh, for your facility or for your therapist uh, working on the machine that the system's installed on. Um, once you're done correcting all of the posture, you can obviously go back to the treatment area, make sure you haven't moved anything in the treatment area. And what you're doing is you're, you're incrementally correcting the posture of this patient before you do delivery. This is a very quick, very easy process uh, and some newer versions of the software, which I, I believe is being shown out here. You can see this in real time as well as 
um, some other postural corrections that we'll talk about. The power of doing things this way uh, is that SGRT is a way of customizing care for your patients. And so when, that, when we think about that in the realm of SGRT and head and neck, um, head and neck patients uh, typically have a very different experience than many of our other patients, maybe not from our brain patients, but they are getting a thermoplastic mask made on, the, on them uh, that holds them in. It. The entire intent is to hold them in a position that they can't move away from, given the fact that we have lots of critical structures that we're uh, delivering dose to. And so we want to facilitate both a patient-specific tolerance that can evolve over time so we can tighten these tolerances down and drive quality in the right direction, but we also want to provide insights into the very specific device fabrication. So we can now use the SGRT system not only as a setup tool, but as a way of measuring the quality of what we're fabricating for these patients. And do we really need to fabricate these devices to deliver these high doses to these patients over time? Overall, we're basically trying to minimize the impact of the care we deliver on our patients on a daily basis. So as they come in, can we minimize the impact without decreasing the quality and the safety of the treatment that we're delivering to our patients? So for head and neck, uh, there isn't a, a lot of great studies as far as the impact. We actually heard uh, some impact about tattoos today, lots of uh, tattooless treatments and the way that impacts the psychology of patients. Um, I had to dig extremely hard going through lots and lots of patient uh, interviews for various uh, publications and different hospitals within the United States have their own internal publications where they interview patients and say, you know, how did your therapy impact you? Uh, what did you like, dislike? These are some of the comments that I found from a lot of the head and neck um, publications, and these are directly out of those publications. And you can see from the very brief at the top that it was awful. It was talking about the mask experience. Uh, all the way down to the bottom, which was probably the most aggressive one that I could come across of how much they hated the mask and what they did to get it. They, they emptied four magazines of 45 round ammunition into the mask and then set it on fire. So there's not many things in my life where that's where I would want to take it, but uh, you can see that there's a, a varying degree of uh, emotional experience with that mask where they project onto that mask the experience that they're having through, throughout their cancer delivery. Uh, the thing I like about uh, the SGRT community, this is kind of like an unabashed proselytization of the SGRT community, so I'm, I'm an ambassador for the SGRT community, um, is when we had the SGRT meeting uh, in Australia earlier this year, uh, Julie McCrossan was a patient advocate who came out and gave her uh, talk about her experience for head and neck cancer. And this was her quote uh, that she actually has up on her website as well that she would like to see or live long enough to see a time when we can remove these masks from patients. Uh, she was a head and neck survivor um, from a late stage head and neck uh, tumor, very aggressive uh, surgery and reconstruction, and survived going through radiation therapy in a mask and had a very uh, personal story at the SGRT meeting, which really impacted kind of my thoughts on head and neck as well, given the fact um, that we have been exploring what can we do with head and neck um, cancers and what can we do with these masks as we go through SGRT. Um, trying to go through the research, this is the only paper that has been published that I'm aware of. Um, I was actually a reviewer on this paper. Um, the, the statistics and things and the conclusions in this paper, I, I would say read it for yourself and, and, and glean what information you can. Uh, the images on the left there uh, are the exact images out of the paper. They modified basically a Q-fix mask uh, to be what they call minimal mask immobilization, but you can see in the middle there that it's, it's a relatively robust mask. Uh, you're really holding this patient's head down. Um, there is very little to the mask that's been removed as far as the neck flap uh, that's folded up for reinforcement, and then the top of the head, which we really typically don't monitor anyway. And so as far as minimal masks go, this is very uh, similar to basically a, a three-point whole brain mask. Uh, the ROIs also are a little bit problematic based on the statistics in the paper. Again, that's left up to the reader to decide whether that's appropriate or not. But they have a methodology, and so there is some research into, is this going to be a robust technique? Um, this is my experience at the institution where I currently oversee physics. Uh, as the chief of physics in 2012, we were very much like most institutions, uh, using full face masks on S-frames. Uh, we then moved in, in like the 2013 to 2014 timeframe to open face masks. Uh, we've had SGRT for a little over a decade. And so we were using open face masks for SRS uh, and some intracranial lesions and things like that. Uh, but we started moving in 2015 more towards a comfort level. So we were trying to use open face masks. We treat a lot of demented and mentally handicapped patients. And so this was more of a comfort move. And as a side effect of looking at the data and a lot of the data analytics that we do, 
they, we were finding that we were replanting a lot of our head and necks uh, a lot less. And we started digging into that data and found in the time and age of VMAT delivery, um, many of the people in the room may even forget that static field IMRT actually still does exist. The machine still will deliver it, but we just don't use it anymore. And so VMAT delivery is very quick, very efficient, but that means as you lose weight, you're actually shooting through less and less of that loss of tissue. So you're, you're not seeing the dosimetrics effects from tissue loss, you're more seeing dosimetrics effects from what we postulated at the time would be postural problems. And so um, as we saw the postural correction being able to be done, we could correct the C-spine curvature of the patients inside these open face masks. We moved in 2017 to an open cranial mask as well as open shoulders so we could fix the clavicular heads and the shoulder positions as we entered into the patients. And we found our statistics for replanting head and necks also dropped even lower. And so 2019, this is what we call our minimal mask uh, immobilization head neck. We have not completely removed masks. Uh, you'll see a chin strap mask. It's only there uh, for the the help of the therapist. So it gives them a, a frame of reference or a, a reference starting position for the chin of the patient. Uh, we can treat these patients without these. Uh, the setup just takes a little bit longer. Um, but overall, this chin strap is largely there to give a reference point for where the patient needs to uh, place their head. The benefits of this, the, this top set of patients, uh, this first patient that you'll see, the, the ability to put in a bite block. Um, this gentleman had a lot of uh, secretion issues, um, ended up with... Um, some other issues throughout treatment. So it was very easy for him to put his bite block in and out. Uh, if he struggled, he could actually wave his hand. We could stop the beam. He could pull his bite block out, bite block out clear his throat, put his bite block back in. We could reset him up and, and move on. Um, the immobilization is a posterior immobilization pillow. As people lose weight for head and neck, they typically lose weight in that fat pad behind their shoulders and neck. And that's where you decrease um, that volume and that tends to change the posture. Now, because we're using SGRT, we can actually correct that posture in real time. We can add a shim behind them. In this case, this gentleman had uh, a bad back problem. So he has a much larger posterior immobilization pillow and just a chin strap max lower uh, down. This, this lady had a squamous cell carcinoma, had a very extensive um, surgery. So required some inset of bolus into the uh, surgical resection area. So we can now do custom bolus if those of you who use masks trying to put bolts under the mask or on top of the mask and all of that tends to be a challenge. These immobilizations allow us to put these custom uh, boluses in the right place and make sure that they're over the treatment area that we're worried about, these spot bolus. Uh, this next gentleman is a recent guy, uh, had a very extensive surgery starting at the top of his head, coming down the back of his head, over his shoulder, and then down into his level five nodes. Uh, so you can see from the, uh, the top view here, and I don't know if I have a laser pointer or not, um, you can see there's not a lot of pillow here because of pain and pressure points. So a lot of the pillows brought over so that we can uh, avoid the surgical site. Um, you can see he's kind of crooked in the pillow from the other view, uh, but this allowed us to basically customize that immobilization, uh, put the chin strap on. And then in this case, because of the kind of lopsidedness of this, we can also mark where the chin strap hits this because so, he doesn't have a lot of uh, anterior uh, superior indexing on the top of his head. So it's a very uh, robust way of setting these patients up and allows us to use SGRT to correct their posture over time as they lose weight. Uh, we set them up very much like an SRS. So you have an ROI over the cranial vault, get the cranial vault and the C-spine in the right position. You have a gross positional ROI that goes over the shoulders. This gets their, their upper body in the right position, but you don't want the shoulders to bias one another because your shoulders will move independent of one another. Uh, and because this is just a root mean squared fit, you want to make sure that you look at each individual shoulder. So you're looking at the various shoulders, make sure they're in the right position, and then you take a simple set of KVs. At our institution, we take KVs Monday through Thursday. Every Friday, we take a comb beam CT. That comb beam CT is used for volumetric dose calculation to make sure that we don't have a dosimetric trigger now for replan, rather than just saying they lost X amount of weight, and now we have to replan. Because we were finding that, the, again, the weight loss was not the issue, it's the posture. And since we're correcting the posture, we now want to see the dosimetric impact of having the correct posture, even though they've lost weight. This gentleman, if you look here, you can see the base of skull, the C-spine, the jaw, the shoulders, the upper chest wall, and the clavicular heads, um, or the clavicles themselves. Even uh, if you look even uh, posterior, you can actually see the uh, shoulder blades as well are all in a very good setup. Um, he needed, like in this case, uh, a one millimeter lateral shift after SGRT setup. So there was, uh, there's no splitting the difference. There's no magic happening here. This gentleman actually at the time of this image had already lost 15 pounds uh, and had really largely no issues going throughout treatment without a replan. 
the, the data, there is no time study data for the old days, full masks, uh, because we were in Mosaic at the time. Uh, we're now in ARIA, so we'll have to do some retrospective analysis on that. We can say that we have not changed our head and neck timeframes. Head and necks are actually being treated in 10 to 15 minute timeframes as far as the time slots themselves. When we look at the ARIA data, they're in and out of the room when they're exiting the room, they're exiting the room around the 10 minute timeframe. So they're being treated in a total from the patient laying down to the patient leaving in about eight to 10 minutes. Uh, the preliminary shift data is shown here. Blue is the old, old days, full face masks. Uh, the orange are those two masks in the middle, the partial open face, head and neck, five point, as well as the open cranial vault, open shoulders, but still with the thoracic mask. And then the gray is what we're seeing now with this minimal mask immobilization uh, with just the chin strap. Uh, people ask all the time, why do you think the, the one with the fuller mask is different? Uh, a lot of times we'd use the mask to correct posture, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Uh, but the mask serves as kind of a pseudo postural reference. How many, how many people who are therapists or radiation techs have said, could you move your chin higher in the mask because you're trying to fill the mask volume with their face because you're using that as your reference. Um, now we're using optics. And so we think we were still kind of cheating it using some of the SGRT and using the masks uh, kind of in this hybrid approach. What this really suggests to us from a, from a data-driven immobilization standpoint is that more posture visibility is a good thing. Uh, and it has implications in a broader aspect of treatment deliveries, proton therapy, um, MRI, uh, where MRI-based uh, Linux now say, well, it doesn't matter if their posture is right, we'll just adaptive replan. Well, that, that sounds great, but that's another hour and a half for your physician to contour and do all the things they need to do at the, at the machine. And so you'd like to basically correct these postural problems ahead of time and not have to adaptive replan every day if you don't have to. And that also goes into ring-based gantry systems like the tomotherapies and the halcyons. Um, Another shameless plug, and I believe she was actually the previous speaker. Um, this was a talk at our uh, SGRT meeting earlier this year in Las Vegas, um, which also talked about head and neck. Uh, this is a partially open mask. This is very similar to what we started doing with the open face mask. I see her right there. I see her smiling. I'm like, all right, I knew she was here. So, uh, But this was a talk. I thought this was very interesting. This is why coming to these meetings is a good thing, uh, because there isn't a lot of published data, but uh, I've already heard um, from the physician earlier this morning about wanting to remove masks. We've had two, we had one case review in one of the uh, breakout sessions, and we also had an incidental kind of pseudo case review as a kind of a example in another session about having to treat a patient who is either claustrophobic or couldn't tolerate a mask uh, with no mask. And so you see these things. Uh, and the thing that I actually love about this talk is because their stats are exactly the same as my stats. And so uh, even though this is not a, something that, I, and I don't know, she would have to correct me if you publish this or not, this actually confirms those, those middle of the road stats that we saw in orange where they were slightly larger than our other two, but they are using a very full mask with an opening. And I believe you were actually even gating on these as well, if my memory uh, selects, uh, if my memory's not failing like my words are right now. Um, <laughs> but they were actually gating on swallows at this, at this point as well. And so the actual closed mask and open mask stats are very similar to our stats, uh, you know, one on either side of the world. So we must be doing something okay, right? Or we're both crazy, either way. Um, but this is another great thing about the SGRT community. You can come and see these things. And when you're working on your own studies, you can actually see some verification that may not be published data, but actually uh, kind of corroborates what you've been doing uh, for, for many, many years. Future for us, we think, um, and I'm sure you've seen some of this at the booth uh, in the next room, uh, this is a postural setup kind of coming out of the things that we're doing here. Um, this postural setup, this is now kind of a pseudo mask, like we talked about using the mask to kind of cheat and telling the patient, kind of move your head up into the mask, move your shoulders up in the mask. This is a virtual mask. It's a high pass filter on your surface. And now you can in video look in various different video feeds from the cameras and you can see that this patient is rotated and you can see the deltas, but you're also using this to correct the posture. So it might not be the posture of the ROI that you're looking at. The deltas are gonna be for the ROI, but the posture can be of the entire patient. And now you can correct that patient in real time. So now you can make a small rotation, your deltas go to essentially zero. Uh, and this is now kind of a virtual mask that we can use instead of a full thermoplastic mask that we're forcing our patients into. And so with that, um, what this means for our patients at Centura, uh, we're currently delivering completely tattooless treatments across 100% of our patients um, at the five facilities that have SGRT. We have quick, accurate, reliable patient identification through MMI connectivity with the true beams, but also through our use of safe RT, which is the facial recognition, which we didn't really get into. Um, but more accurate setups, which we've seen a lot of uh, studies and audits for uh, throughout the day. Uh, more, shorter, more efficient treatment times. We've seen lots of uh, studies today as well that kind of corroborate that. 
constant monitoring before, during, and after imaging. This is that augmentation of your IGRT process using SGRT to augment your patient's position before you have to use a 6D couch. Um, 6D couches are not posturepedic couches. So if you have bends and changes in posture, your 6D couch is not going to fix that. Um, I hate the term split the difference. Uh, I tell everyone, there's that, what's the movie? When you hear bell ring, angel gets its wings. When a therapist says I split the difference, somewhere a physicist dies. And so um, that is the worst phrase ever uttered in, in the human language. Um, but there's no more splitting the difference because now you can correct the posture ahead of time. Uh, and then comfort without sacrificing quality and safety. Again, we want to minimize the impact that we have on these patients' lives as they come in for treatment. We want to make sure they're getting the highest level of quality without you know, diminishing safety and everything for the sake of being quick. And so that's what patient satisfaction means to us at Centura, and that's what we're using SGRT to drive to our facilities. And I hope that was close to 15 minutes because my timer wasn't working, so. <laughs>